And um, it's like the, the last song we sang. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. That's a conviction. If you've decided, for instance, that uh, God is sovereign and that His Word is your final authority, listen, it doesn't matter if you lose your job or lose your life. That's your conviction. You'll, you'll follow it. Uh, we've looked at uh, our purpose, that our purpose is to seek the Lord, and to serve the Lord. We've looked at our body. You know, we need to have a, a conviction about our body. Uh, it's His, the Bible says. Uh, we've looked at our church. We need to have a scriptural church, and we need to be scriptural members of a church. <laughs> uh, we've looked at our children. Now, not all of you have children, but... Uh, we, uh, we need to have a conviction about, about family and about um, our, our activities, how we live our lives. Tonight we're looking at marriage. If you're not married tonight, that's all right. There's, there's still a conviction here that you can, uh, you can find. Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. I, I think, I, I meant to check, uh, that might be the verses we have on the sign out in front. I'm not sure. He said, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. I don't know how other people conduct marriages anymore, but uh, it used to be part of the marriage ceremony was till death us do part. Uh, you know, we, we believed, whether we practiced it or not, uh, that marriage was one man and one woman for life. And uh, the Bible still, still teaches that. The, the subject tonight is faithfulness in marriage. Now, just a little bit to the left is the book of Malachi. Now, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2. Let me show you what God says on this subject. Now, the thing he's talking about here is both marriage and also Israel's faithfulness to God, the nation's faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, but it, it applies to both here. Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. There's some real strong words in, in these verses. He says, have, you, have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. You can see he's applying it to them as a nation. You'll get to the... Uh, uh, men and women as well. The Lord will cut off the man that doth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And, and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you deal not treacherously. So, uh, he talks about faithfulness in marriage. And the key to faithfulness in marriage is your spirit. Did you notice several times he mentions, take heed to your spirit, the end of verse 15, the end of verse 16. Take heed to your spirit. And he talks about uh, treachery. The word treachery means treason or a violation of allegiance. It's the opposite of being faithful. When I think of treachery, I think of Judas. You know, Judas was a follower of the Lord, and, and yet he, he betrayed him. And it, as I thought about that, it made me think of some of, of the different disciples and how they relate to marriage. Now, this is just a, uh, just a thought, but uh, you know, Judas are, are like people who betray their marriage. Peter is like those who have every good intention, but they betray their marriage. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, Peter denied the Lord. Thomas is like those who are negative. You know, there's, uh, there's people like that in marriage. James and John, sons of thunder, are angry. You know, you get that in a marriage, and man, that's, uh, that makes it very difficult. Some are like, do you, do you remember those who when Jesus preached, it said they, they walked no more with him? 
There was not just the 12 disciples, there was many. Uh, some are like the disappearing disciples. They just uh, disappear. And the key is that we need to be like Jesus. And when he says there, take heed to your spirit. And, and this doesn't apply just to marriage. This applies to life in general. Take heed to your spirit. You know, too often we think, oh, that's just the way I am. Or that's just the way it is because of the circumstances. You know, it's like the person, they ask them, how are you doing? They say, well, pretty good under the circumstances. He said, well, what are you doing down there? <laughs> yeah, we're not people who have to yield our spirit to the circumstances. We yield our spirit to the Lord. And we have excellent examples in Scripture. Joseph, thrown in prison, betrayed by his brothers, yet he had an excellent spirit. Daniel, Paul in the New Testament, you know, people who, who went through extreme difficulties and yet their spirit was right. From prison, he writes the book of Philippians about joy. <laughs> I mean, you, you put a, that's pretty hard to, to imagine. And yet it's true as Christians. And we need to apply this to our marriage. We need to apply it to life. Take heed to your spirit. We need to have and to practice the fruit of the spirit. Now, you may not be married tonight, but you can, you can still apply this principle to be like Jesus, to be faithful. And I want to consider some areas of faithfulness. Uh, one of those, it, it seems a little bit um, misplaced, but uh, it, it's where I wanted to start. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, be faithful financially. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, be faithful financially. And, and the statement he makes is this, it's about the home. He says, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And what he's saying there is, uh, if you don't, if you're not faithful financially, if you're not looking after your family financially, he says, you're worse than the lost people. You're worse than the heathen. They do that. God intends for us to work. You know, right from the book, the book of Genesis, uh, he talks about how you're, you make a living by the sweat of your brow. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, he says, if any would not work, neither should he eat. I don't know how you are, but I'm addicted to eating. And uh, so I work, you know. I like to eat. And the key is this, and I don't mean to make light of it. God doesn't want us to be lazy. And one of the reasons I start here is that many times the reason people have trouble in their marriage is because they're lazy. And I don't just mean financially. In other ways, in, in taking care of the things that need to be taken care of. One of the bits of advice I was given... When I started in the ministry, I was a music man. I was, you know, the, probably about the fifth man on the, on the, on the staff. And uh, the fellow whose place I was taking, was an old, he was a really old fellow. He was probably 40 or more. You know? <laughs> and his advice to me was, when you see something that needs to be done, do it. And he was talking about in the service, but, you know, in, as well in other ways. You know, if something needs to be taken care of, he said, don't stop and think and wait and wish. Go do it. And you know, the, the reason many times we have trouble in life is because we know something needs to be done and, well, maybe someday I'll, I'll take care of that. Maybe someday I'll do the right thing by my wife or, or by my husband or whatever. Uh, in Proverbs, there, there, we'll look at Proverbs several times tonight. Proverbs chapter 6, he warns us about being lazy. And laziness will, will ruin any relationship, but particularly a, a marriage. Proverbs 6 and verse 6, he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. It's amazing, isn't it? Ants don't have to have somebody tell them what to do. There's no boss ant. They just all get stuck in and, and do it. And he uses a word there, go to the ant, thou, thou sluggard. The next verse, how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? You know, one of the problems with a person who's lazy a person who's a sluggard. Uh, I, I get this from Scripture. It's Proverbs 26, verse 16. Most lazy people don't recognize that they're lazy. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. A sluggard always has ten reasons why it couldn't be done, and why he shouldn't have done it even if it could have been. Uh, they're wiser in their own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. A sluggard doesn't believe he's a sluggard. And yet everybody around him knows it. And God can help a sluggard. Uh, he, can, he can help them. And uh, if you 
Notice yourself in some of these verses. Uh, take heed. Uh, a sluggard makes many soft choices. He's regularly taking the easy way out. Uh, doesn't finish the job. And as a result, he lives in a world of wishful thinking. Proverbs 21, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long. But the righteous giveth and spareth not. You know, when you're, when you're righteous, you not only work, you're able to help others. Uh, be faithful financially. Faithfulness means doing our part. Now, I want to say a couple of things here. Uh, we have some young people here tonight. Young people, do your part. Uh, your mother is not your maid. Uh, she shouldn't be out there mowing the lawn. Uh, do your part. Don't, don't make her tell you, have to, tell you to have to clean your room. Do your part. Get in the habit of doing the job when it needs to be done, whether it's easy or not. You'll find if you'll, if you'll do things as they come up, life's a lot easier than if you let 20 things pile up and all of a sudden you've got to do them all. Um, wives. God says in Titus chapter 2 that women are to be keepers at home. You know, as I, as I looked at that this week, I thought, yo, that's a, there's a radical statement. <laughs> Why should we think that's so hard? You know, the world is saying, oh, you know, we've got house husbands, we've got this and we've got that, and, you know, they're, they're so confused. They're not the ones we want to listen to. Being faithful means doing your part. Man, we're to be the breadwinners. We're not to send our, our wives out to be the breadwinners. Now, I know there's, there's exceptions to that, and I'm, I'm not preaching against women working here or any, anything like that, but uh, the wife is the one who makes it a home. She sets the attitudes. The husband sets the directions. And you'll find that finances cause many problems in the home. We need to be faithful financially. Secondly, boy, I left a lot of unanswered questions there, didn't I? Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15, we need to be faithful physically. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15, I love how God puts things. He's so discreet and so gentle. Uh, he makes a statement here about faithfulness in marriage. And here's how he puts it. Proverbs 5.15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Isn't that nice? You know what he's talking about? Being faithful to your husband, being faithful to your wife. Not taking care of your thirst with somebody else. That's exactly what he's talking about. Let's, let's read on. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. You know, people who aren't faithful, a lot of times they don't know whose, whose child that is. They have children, but they don't know if it's from their fountain. Verse 18, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? That's plain speaking, isn't it? God's just saying, be faithful physically, sexually, uh, in, in your marriage. Drink from your own well. Now, there's three, I think, important words for, for a marriage. The first one is the word rejoice in verse 18. Husband and wives need to rejoice together. Now, there's a... Again, I love how the Lord puts this. This is found in Genesis 26, verse 8. It makes me laugh every time I read it. It's when um, Isaac, for some reason these guys would travel and they'd tell people, oh, this is not my wife, this is my sister. <laughs> Several times they do this. Anyway, in Genesis 26, verse 8, is it 8? Let's see, yeah. Let me get the right chapter. It came to pass that uh, when they'd been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. It, the Lord puts it very gently, but they were doing something that the king said, of a surety she is thy wife. How saidst thou she's my sister? <laughs> they were doing something where he knew that's his wife. <laughs> they were sporting. They were rejoicing together. That's a good thing in a marriage, all right? Uh, physically, uh, husband and wife need to rejoice together. The other word is there in verse 19. It's the word satisfy. Be satisfied. 
You know, we live in a, a world of pornography nowadays. I heard some statistic the other day of you know, all this pornography, and one of the terrible things about it, not only that people are watching it, people are making it. That's a lot of people involved. Oh, what a wicked world we live in. And it's all to make us not satisfied with who we are and who we're married to. I, I read a thing about pornography that says it's addictive and it's progressive. You, you can't just do a little bit. It's like drugs. And uh, don't uh, get into that kind of thing. Let Be satisfied with your husband. Be satisfied uh, with your wife. Pornography is always wrong, married or unmarried. Uh, I find it interesting how strong a position God takes on sexual immorality. It, it seems to be something that not only affects us physically, but affects us spiritually. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.18, for instance. 1 Corinthians 6.18, he says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body or outside the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It not only affects us mentally and spiritually, it affects us physically. And our world is, is suffering uh, because of it. In 2 Timothy 2.22, similar kind of a statement, he says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness. It, you know, it's an active uh, decision that we have to make uh, to be uh, satisfied, to be right with God and with our husband and with our wife. The, the other one, I won't spend any time on it, but he says, Be thou ravished. Ravish, is a, that's a good word in a marriage. Uh, just be captivated. Just enjoy your, your marriage. Uh, God wants us to, God gave us marriage. Uh, You've got to be careful when you're talking about things like this. I mean, you know, the world started with two naked people in a garden, and God, uh, you know, that was God's, God's working, and he, he did the first wedding ceremony. And, uh, you know, Eve didn't have to worry about what she wore at the wedding. <laughs> she was clothed in the glory of God. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's move on. Be faithful. Be faithful physically. And a lot of that has to do with what you think about. You know, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Uh, that brings us to the next point. Be faithful emotionally. Uh, the verse I'd have you look at is Colossians 3, verse 9. Colossians 3 and, and verse 9. And you know, all of this relates back to guard your spirit. Guard your spirit. Take heed to your spirit. Make sure that you're right with the Lord. Uh, be faithful financially, physically. Be faithful emotionally. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Now, I'm not sure why God particularly put it in, in, in that way. But relationships cause emotions. There's emotions involved in relationships. He particularly warns husbands about not being bitter against their wives. I think it affects both men and women. But bitterness can lead to terrible things. And in marriage, it'll, it'll tear it apart. You know, in Acts chapter 8, it talks about Simon. Do you remember Simon? And uh, Peter says to him, you're in the gall of bitterness and iniquity. And he was bitter against God, that's what it was. In Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about Esau. In Hebrews 12 and, and verse 15, he says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You know, bitterness doesn't just stay within. It, uh, it, it takes off. And it, it doesn't just hurt the bitter person, although that's the main person it hurts. It hurts uh, many people. Be faithful emotionally. Let me make a statement here. If you're a grown-up, act like a grown-up. Master your emotions. Your emotions are not there to rule you. They're there for you to enjoy life and to make decisions. Uh, put in your notes there, and I, I'm sure I've shared this with you probably many times before, a plan of action. Uh, some things that you can do uh, when emotions come in. Number one is A, admit you have the emotion. We've all heard somebody say, I am not angry! <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, admit you have the emotion. That's the first step in dealing with it. I'm sad. I'm, I'm angry. I'm bitter. Uh, I'm upset. Secondly, C is consider the source. Uh, that's a difficult thing 
because mainly the source is your heart. <laughs> uh, now you can consider where it comes from externally. You know, this happened, this happened, and this is how I responded. Uh, but you need to consider the source. T is thank God he will help. This is the hope involved in, in this situation. We have God's promise that there's a solution. Listen, don't take drugs for an emotional problem. That will avoid God's answer. Thank God that he will help. And then I is identify the proper biblical response. That's so important. You know, it's one thing to see you have the problem. It's one thing, another thing to know God will help. But then you have to see, well, what does God say to do? Identify the proper biblical response. And then O is obey what God teaches. Sometimes you won't feel like it. Listen, if you're ever going to be a hypocrite, be a hypocrite to your feelings. <laughs> Don't go by your feelings. Go by the truth. One of our uh, Proverbs ABCs was Proverbs 16.3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. If you'll keep doing what's right, your thoughts will eventually follow. If you'll just keep doing what's right. Now, we're talking about marriage. In marriage, just keep doing what's right. God will help you uh, with your thinking. And then the, the last and end is nurture the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Be on God's side in this thing. Work with it. <laughs> nurture the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Don't nurture your bitterness. I've talked to people who have perfect memory of things that have happened 40 years ago. Because they're bitter about it. Man, every once in a while, they, it's, it's like the family pet. You know, they trot that thing out and they know what was said and what happened and who did and what and why they shouldn't have. Don't, don't live that way. That's not a way to live. Don't nurture your bitterness. There's an amazing couple of verses. You need to know these or at least know where they are. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's the put off. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. See, that's our attitude. Uh, we need to master our emotions. We need to be faithful emotionally. He warns us as men. I've never understood women, but I understand men, at least this man, sometimes. Uh, and boy, it, it, it can happen. You know, you can, uh, you can give in to, to bitterness if, if you choose to. Take heed to your spirit. My marriage is a lifelong commitment to God and to my marriage partner. That needs to be a conviction. Number four, be faithful mentally. It's similar to, to our emotions, but for instance, Romans 12 and, and verse 2, uh, you probably know this verse. Romans 12, 2, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yield your mind to the Lord. Uh, let God control your thinking, your thoughts. Your mind can seem like a secret world that nobody else knows about. But the problem is, what you think about will form who you are. And who you are will eventually come out. You know, we're hearing in, in the news of different ones who've done this and done that and uh, you know, you don't always know if they have or not, but the reason people do those kind of things, the, the immoral acts that, that they talk about, it starts in the mind. It starts in the mind. Let God control your thinking and your thoughts. Uh, in Ephesians 4.23, he, he uses the phrase, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. God can change your, your thinking. And how do we do that? Well, the way we change our thinking is we, we look to Jesus. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, let me read that verse to you so I get it exactly right. Y you'll know this, you'll recognize it. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what's he saying there? Just concentrate on Jesus and you'll start to become like him. Immerse yourself in his word. You know, read it, think about it, memorize it, talk about it. Consciously replace wrong thinking with right thinking. You know, sometimes you'll get in such a habit of wrong thinking that, that you'll forget it's wrong thinking until you get back to God's word and say, oh, that's not right. Consciously replace 
wrong thinking with right thinking. You know, if you're not happy in your life, in your relationships, maybe with your husband or with your wife, your relationships reflect your relationship to God. That's so important to, to remember. Uh, if you're unhappy with those relationships, they're just reflecting your relationship to God. Take heed to your spirit. If your goal is to get what, get what you want, and that's a lot of people, isn't it? You'll have a selfish marriage. You'll damage your mate. You'll damage the spirit of your home. But if your goal is to be what God intends, then God can bless. That needs to be our goal. You know, the world today thinks our goal is to be happy. Boy, that's a bad goal. Uh, th there's an awful lot of terrible ways you can, you can make that happen uh, that hurts everybody. Uh, our goal is not to be happy. Our goal is to be what God wants us to be. And let me encourage you here. I'm, I'm going to use the word, make a unilateral commitment to be faithful to God. Now, by that I mean we're talking about relationships, particularly marriage and others. You be faithful whether anybody else is or not. It used to be in, in the marriage ceremony, you know, we'd talk about keeping ourselves only and so on. And, you know, we'd make this commitment in, in marriage. And we didn't say, and we'll do it if, I'll do it if you will. <laughs> we gave a commitment. I'm going to be faithful. The other one gave a commitment. I'm going to be faithful. And we both should. But whether they are or not, I need to be faithful. That's what I'm talking about. A unilateral commitment to be faithful to God. That's the kind of... Uh, of conviction we're talking about. My marriage is a lifelong commitment to God and to my marriage partner. Uh, let, let me finish with this. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, we need to be faithful spiritually. The, the reason we fall down in all these other areas, uh, husband and wife and so on, is because we're not as faithful to God as we should be. Ephesians 5, uh, verse 25 very familiar portion of Scripture about marriage. He says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You know, when we're not faithful in these, these areas, it's because we're not as faithful to God as, as we should be. You know, God says here, this, He says, love your wife. Now, ladies, you, you apply it to your situation. The standard is, as Christ also loved the church. Wow, that's a high standard. Sacrificial, a pure. And the source, we know from here and other places, God is love. The source is, is the Lord. If you want to find out about love, uh, I always go to 1 John. You know, it, it tells us a lot of things there. Uh, you know, we sing 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. See, that's our source. That's where we've got to go to. And when God says, uh, guard your spirit, watch your spirit, it means we need to be uh, conforming it to the image of Christ, conforming it to, to Him. And if you'll accept God's love, one of the things that will happen is you'll be able to love Him in return. You know, he says in First John, we love Him because He first loved us. You'll be able to reflect it to Him, and you'll be able to love others. First John 4.11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Love us of God. That's the source. That's where we've got to go. Uh, the source uh, is not your husband or your wife. The source is not the world. The source is not a situation or a place. You can go on and on, couldn't you, where people look to, for something to, to make them happy. The source is the Lord. God is love. And in Him uh, is where we need to, to find it. My marriage is a lifelong commitment to God and to my marriage partner. You know, as men, our, our goal is to be like Jesus, to be faithful. As women, as young people, uh, your goal is to, is to be like Jesus, to be faithful. Take heed to your spirit. Let me encourage you tonight. As I was going over this this afternoon, I thought, man, this, this is an awful lot of material here, but uh, you're good for it. We're going to go to page 427, 
And I want you to really consider this song as we sing it tonight. Uh, this is really the essence of what I've said. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. It's page 427. Let's, let's stand.